Ladies and gentlemen, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, dear friends, dear colleagues, it's my privilege and a real pleasure to welcome you today, and it's also a true honor to do this uh, introduction to the day dedicated to uh, debates and conversations organized in the context of a cultural initiative for Europe called Christine de Suède l'Européenne, no, no need to translate, which is the fruit of uh, an intensive cooperation between the Austrian Embassy, l'Institut Français de Suède, the Italian Cultural Institute, and the uh, Musique pour la Tête. Today is part of a series of events linked to the initiative. We already started with a conference uh, months ago at Stockholm University on the theme, the culture on the move. And hopefully we will organize another one next fall in Sweden and some other will follow in France, Austria and Italy. We have chosen a pretext to launch the reflection. It's the music that Christina used to listen to and to promote in a time that will be played in the four partner countries. The concerts will be the starting point of conferences and other events. So, the objectives of the project are to enhance a reflection and to ensure the widest possible audience for Europe of culture to sensitize as many people as possible on what makes that Europe in its diversity, multilingualism, and its concern for developing all fields of knowledge. We believe in that Europe where citizens share the same values, the same principle of tolerance, freedom, creativity, and love for arts and science. Technical problems we are facing today being overcome, we will mobilize all necessary means to reach these objectives. A festival and an academy of music, several schools and universities are involved in the project. Exchange program will be implemented, competitions of all kinds will be organized while reaching a larger audience. A French TV channel and a filmmaker are producing a documentary and a long picture movie on Queen Christina. For today, we shall focus the reflection on three different aspects. First, there will be a conversation between, between writers who spend some time if I may say so, in the intimacy of Christine, Queen Christina, and we can therefore talk about. Through the theme of romantic lie and historic truth, they will approach the controversial personality of this capital figure. Their point of view will certainly be of importance for the following exercise, where poetic and politic will be confronted in order to answer the double question, does Europe for culture need an emblem to federate citizens? And how Queen Christina could be that emblem, symbol, allegory, the specialists will decide on the proper term. This afternoon, young academics and decision makers will consider the impact of Queen Christina on youth today through our modernity. And before or to end this introduction, I would like to express special thanks to our sponsors and partners, Air France and Falk Universität, who made this event possible. A sincere thank to our colleagues from Austria, Austrian Embassy, Italian Cultural Institute, Musique Post Lotet, Livrust Camaren, 
Steve Stelson, Ung Lederkade, thanks to Waltraud, Paolo, Matt, Madeleine, Sofia, and all the others. And of course, I would like to thank all the participants, speakers, moderators who came from Austria, France, Italy, and Sweden, and gave their precious time for the sake of the cultural initiative for Europe in the spirit of Queen Christina. Thank you for your attention. Your Excellence, dear moderators and speakers, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Royal Armory, I would like to welcome you all to our museum. Some of you have been here before, while it, for others, probably is a new experience. Nevertheless, the Royal Armory is indeed a suitable choice for this seminar, since the museum, in several aspects, is intimately connected to today's historical inspiration, Queen Christina and her time. The museum itself was founded by Christina's father, Gustavus Adolphus, who in 1628 decided that two costumes that he had worn when he was wounded during the Polish war campaign forever should be kept in the Royal Armory as a perpetual memento of his historical mission. Later, his horse, his saddle, and blood-stained buff coat from the Battle of Lützen, where he was killed in 1632, were added to the collection. Christina was then six years old when she lost her father. Accordingly, in 1628, the foundation for a tradition was laid, which in the long run meant that the Royal Armory, step by step, was changed from being a storage for weapons and horse equipment to a historical collection, a museum. In this early history of the museum, Queen Christina and the choices she made has played a somewhat unusual role. She's actually the cause of, or the woman behind, the museum's oldest inventory. The abdication of Queen Christina and her decision to leave the country suddenly made it necessary to decide what objects she actually owned and what was to be regarded as state property. This being so much more important since it before her abdication were no fixed boundaries between Christina's private possessions and the crowns. To simplify, I guess you can say that what you today find among the museum's oldest material is what she couldn't or wouldn't bring with her. So, what objects do we today have from Queen Christina here in the collection of the Royal Armory? Mostly, these are luxurious ceremonial objects which can contribute to the official image of her, the making of a king, to use the words of Peter Burke, such as, for example, her coronation robe and canopy, as well as weapons and horse equipment from her armory. Expensive diplomatic gifts given to the young queen are also existent. Thanks to lucky circumstances, a unique piece of garment a little pink satin bodice worn by Christina at the age of one or two has been saved. Don't miss it when you walk your way through the museum. It has a very special aura. These objects are all, in a way, memories of a queen who died more than 300 years ago. However, the queen herself has, through the history, proven to be more or less of continual current interest and put into new perspectives. A part of this fascination for Christina is probably that she was a person who is almost impossible to characterize in a few words, and the roles she played during her lifetime were many and different. In the Royal Armory, we are currently preparing next year's large exhibition called Images of Christina. The exhibition is part of a joint project with the Vatican Library, the National Archives, the Stockholm Cathedral, and the Foreign Ministry through our Ambassador to the Holy See, Miss Ulla Gudmundsson. Besides the Royal Armouries exhibition, there will be a smaller exhibition in the Stockholm Cathedral, two research seminars, and a richly illustrated publication. A number of researchers, for example, Stefano Fogelberg-Rota 
and Susanna Åkerman, who we have here today, uh, have been connected to the project as a reference group. The spectacular highlight in the exhibition will be some manuscripts from Queen Christina's famous manuscript collection in the Vatican Library. In the exhibition, we are exploring perceptions and images of Christina from the 17th century and up until today. What has created the various and contradictory images of the Swedish queen? In what way has, for example, structures of power, religious issues and gender played a role? Questions which I know for sure would be the topic of interest during some of the presentations and discussions today. And I would like to encourage you all to contact one of us among the producers, uh, myself, Anne Grönhammar, if you can wave over there, Director of PT of the Royal Armory, uh, Dr. Per Sandin, somewhere in here perhaps, there he is, uh, or Education Officer Jonas Lindvall over there, uh, if you have some ideas or thoughts that you would like to share with us during the day. I th hope and think that we will, we will all have a very interesting seminar here today, and once again, Warmly welcome to the Royal Armory of Stockholm. Well, buongiorno a tutti, bonjour a tous, good morning, good morning. Well, we are here today to talk about free books that have been published recently. The first one appeared in uh, 2005, the Amazon von Rom, das abenteuerliche Leben der Christina von Schweden, by Gloria Kaiser. The second one come out in 2008 is Poesie in Strotning, Christina Absperia och Domitalienska Akademien, by Stefano Fogelberg Rota, while the third appeared in France in 2010, and it's a novel, Le Chiquier de la Reine, by Jan Kerlou. These books are very different from each other. The first one is a biography, the second one is a scientific study of Christina's role within Rome cultural life and more precisely of her context with Italian poets like Alessandro Guidi, Francesco de Lemene, Vincenzo da Filicaia, who will create the Academy of Arcadia. And the third one is a novel conceived as a, some sort of autobiography. We should have also talked today about a fourth book, published in Italy in 2011, Le Passioni dell'Anima, I will show you the book, The Passions of the Soul, Le Passions de l'Âme, written by an eminent Italian linguist, Professor Raffaele Simone, and focused on the relationship between Cristina and Descartes. Unfortunately, Professor Simone couldn't come to Stockholm due to other commitments. The amount of books about Christina that have been recently published all over Europe clearly doesn't surprise us. In fact, few historical figures have fascinated artists, scholars, musicians, film directors and dramatists as Christina did. It's difficult not to feel attracted by Christina's rich personality and by her various and sometimes contradictory characteristics. What we get from biographies, dramas and music pieces are many different images of Christina. The conventional Minerva of the North, generous patron of artists and scholars, the hysterical, spantry, fickle and lustful Christina on which many biographers focused in the 19th century, the bloodthirsty and pitiless Christina who got Manaldesco killed in the Deer Gallery in Fontainebleau Castle. Well, I would like to start this round table discussion with a simple question, but at the same time quite complicated one. What was the influence on your books 
of the huge amount of already existing biographical studies on Christina, not to mention fictions, films, and dramas, did you take account of all those works, or did you try to consider them in order to approach directly Christina's figure? Well, in other words, to be simple, who is your own Christina? Please, Gloria. to Christina for sure is uh, a special one. My approach comes <coughs> by the Lusitanian Jesuit father, Antonio Vieira. So I am each year for two or three months in Brazil, and there in Brazil uh, is this Jesuit father, Antonio Vieira. He lived uh, from 1608 to 1691. Uh, he is more or less a saint, and 20 years ago, I always heard uh, Antonia Vieira and Christina of Sweden, and uh, I must say, till this moment, I was not so very interested in Christina. I knew that was this uh, very important point in Innsbruck, the conversion. Uh, but then I, I began to study and to research, and, and uh, this was really research without end, because uh, till today it continues. First uh, was this book, and uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, I published a book in Portuguese about this special friendship between Cristina and Antonia Vieira. And uh, for me, Cristina is such a fascinating female human being, not only a woman, it's more. Uh, yes, I, I must say this. And uh, I, wa I was, uh, for example, a couple of uh, times in, also in Rome, in the Archivo Secretos, because this friendship was in this way. Antonio Vera was a Jesuit father, and he was, uh, he was born in Lisbon, 1608, and at the age of six years, he came with his parents to Salvador Bahia and then he grew up in Brazil, and he was uh, in the missions, and he returned to Lisbon, then he was 10 years as a diplomat all over Europe. And at that time, the Inquisition of Coimbra uh, observed Antonio Vera very strict, because he always, uh, his sermons were very, very hard and strict against all these forms of exploitation, in Brazil, the slavery and all these things. And he fought for uh, that the Jews could, came, could come back to Portugal at that time. And uh, so the Inquis Inquisition of Coimbra, they were looking for a form to condemn, uh, to, to bring him to the fire. This is <laughs> was, uh, was the goal. But it was at that time not possible because uh, so Antonio Vera was what we today would say chic or fashionable. Uh, his sermons were published in French and also in, in, in Portuguese. He, he didn't uh, write only in Latin. So in the intellectual circles uh, in Europe, the sermons were well known. Also Christina had a couple of pages. So what was uh, in 1669, the so Inquisition of Coimbra took Antonio Vera for five years, he was banished to Rome. And he was then in the uh, Engelsburg for five years, and at that time, uh, Christina just lived in Rome. And in, just in the moment when she heard, oh, Antonio Vera is coming, she had a meeting with the Pope and said, please, would this be possible that Antonio Vera would be my personal preacher or whatever? This was not possible, but uh, according to her principle, Vater via mim venient, uh, destiny found ways and means, and so during the night, it uh, was possible for Antonio Vera to leave uh, the prison and make a walk to Riario, 
and they had their meetings and the official reason was he took uh, Italian lessons by Christina and the result of this friendship are really wonderful sermons and wonderful texts and also this book. Thank you. Uh, French, French, we sometimes have extravagant ideas, and I started with uh, the idea of writing first a biography, was, uh, which was uh, uh, an idea, but it had been done many times, so I changed my mind, and uh, I decided that uh, Christina deserved some other way of looking at her. First of all, I felt quite attracted by her modernity, I would say, uh, the way she she dealt with people, uh, her decision, which were sometimes courageous, sometimes critical, uh, and there was also a feeling, which was, uh, let's say, the attraction uh, Christina has always had on French people, not only because she invited Descartes uh, to Stockholm, uh, that was the first uh, Thing that everybody knows, because, because unfortunately the poor man uh, dead here, not because of the queen, but because it was very cold. Uh, but this being said, uh, that was also, uh, for me, as far as I'm concerned, I would say, uh, the attraction she had remained uh, something we can deal with today. Uh, what I would like to say is that her values, the way she is, let's say, interested in other culture, other people, other countries. Needless to, to remember that she, she spoke fluently six or seven languages. Uh, at that time, that was absolutely unusual. And the way also she was, let's say, looking at the world as an open map, uh, where everybody could uh, uh, speak to everybody, and she was not uh, she was not concerned with let's say uh, conflicts wars because she has had let's say she she was the first to to put an end to the thirty years war, which was quite a political achievement, uh, maybe a main achievement during a, a career as a queen. And uh, apart from that, when she started the, the second part of her life after her abdication, she was clever enough to, to create a, a court, uh, an exile court in Rome, and she became the, the symbol of uh, uh, Europe enlightenment. And so, the, you know, there's different aspects. I mean, not only uh, her attraction for other countries and other culture, but also the fact that she, she was one of the greatest collectors uh, of art of her time. Uh, all those things uh, still have a great power of attraction for every one of us. Stephen. Well, uh, my interest in Christina, uh, I would say, comes from school time. <laughs> it's actually where I met Christina first. Uh, uh, studying in Italy, in Genova. Uh, my father is Italian, my mother is Swedish. And uh, uh, in school books, you get to learn in Italy that Cristina founded Academia dell'Arcadia. That's a note, uh, all, uh, usually no more than two, three lines, but actually she has her own role, role in the, uh, Italian literary history, which uh, uh, it's quite amazing if you think that she was uh, a Swedish queen, uh, converted to Catholicism and uh, uh, settled in Rome. So this interest started then uh, in seeing how uh, a Swede, actually, in my position as um, uh, Italo Svedese, uh, <laughs> a Swede could actually uh, um, intervene in Italian literature and make such uh, important achievements. And they were important for real because uh, Academia dell'Arcadia is a very important period in Italian literature. Uh, sometimes it is uh, described as the beginning of a, um, 
uh, modern, maybe it's the wrong word, but uh, at least uh, another approach to language and to culture uh, with the, the aim of uh, um, um, using a, a more, um, uh, of moving from uh, Baroque literature and uh, the complex metaphors and uh, complex language. Uh, so, uh, I guess that my Christina uh, is uh, uh, the Minerva you talked about, mm -hmm. uh, Paolo, and uh, uh, but uh, uh, this Minerva, she has two sides. On one side, of course, the historical Christina, uh, the patron of arts we know, uh, very important in all the fields, uh, art, music, literature, but also the image she wanted herself to uh, give to posterity. Um, and then I guess there, there are so many Christinas you want to, um, as you said, uh, all these different characters. Uh, on one side, there's a committed uh, patron, and on the other side, uh, uh, the less glorious images uh, that have been created after her life. So well, this is more or less my Christina, I would say. So thank you. Um, it's uh, quite significant that from this answer, there is uh, already an idea of this many Christina, because uh, uh, Gloria Kaiser has mentioned his her relation with uh, uh, Antonio Vieira and so the, the religious interest in the life of Cristina. And then there is uh, the cultural aspect and the connection with the literature in particular. And then there is the very adventurous life of uh, Cristina as well that uh, um, has a quite a strong evidence in your book, Jan. And, but there is a crucial moment in her life that still seems to me quite difficult to explain, and it's the abdication. I must confess, because I'm, I'm not a specialist, that the abdication is still, for me, quite a, a black hole, difficult to interpret, to, to understand. So I would like to know your opinion. Um, to, to, uh, on this crucial moment, which are the, the, the most important motivations, in your opinion, for this uh, decision that will change completely her life? I think uh, in Christina, the inside development was totally another development than the outside. Uh, uh, all her people, her educators, her advisors, uh, they knew totally another Christina because outside, I think, till her 18, 20 year of life, she worked and, and was like a clockwork. And inside, uh, she was far away of all these uh, obligations. She began after the death of her father, totally an, an, another way for me. Uh, this political reason, I, I cannot, I cannot uh, say why she did this, the abdication. But inside for her it was clear, I, I have the only intention to go my free way and, and in my free path and, and, and then she prepared this in secret more or less, years by years. And, and she was finished inside in her development. For me, for me it is incredible to do this, this uh, self-education, to come to this uh, decision and then to do this, to realize. But I, I can, and can feel with her. But for sure, never. We, we had another example in our European history mm -hmm. for that an action. Yes, you have pointed out that you have, she has prepared this decision for many years. But how important was the religious uh, aspect in, in this decision? For sure, I know also this sentence, often we read this, uh, now she is fallen in the hands of the Jesuits, for example, to uh, converge from the Protestantism to Catholicism. Perhaps she had also not uh, the right information, this I also say, 
that, for example, a Copernicus was up on the list of the index, perhaps, you know. Mm. <laughs> um, she saw in the, I think, in the, Catholic, by the with the Catholics more mysticism and, and um, perhaps this would be for her the intention. But uh, the political reason I, I, I cannot follow. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I, do, I do believe that her decision to, to abdicate was certainly uh, a bit complicated to summarize in a few words. What I keep in mind is that, and we, we don't have to forget it, she was surrounded by suitors and potential husbands. And uh, she was supposed to get married and have hair, which uh, was not exactly a cup of tea. She had other ideas. And I think that she took the opportunity uh, of her own interest for religions, not only Catholicism, but also others, to find a way. And that's why she, she decided to ask Jesuits to come over and discuss with her. She had already had many discussions with Descartes when he was there. And suddenly she realized that it could give her a way to change totally uh, a way of being and a, a destiny. And on the other side, uh, it has to be remembered also that for the Pope, it was a victory he would not, not have even, let's say, dreamed of. Because can you imagine, let's say, the Minerva of the North, who suddenly uh, leaves a country, decides to abdicate, and comes to Rome. And that was one, uh, one, not only one extraordinary victory for Catholicism, but also uh, for, let's say, the Spanish, because the King of Spain uh, was a protector in a, in a decision. And she, she, in that way, she is very close to us, because she, she looked at her own destiny and decided suddenly that she wanted something else. Uh, she, had a, she had a kingdom. Uh, that was one thing for sure. But she wanted to have, let's say, her own destiny and her own path. So it happened maybe the second part of her, of her life. And also she was, she was looked at from, let's say, the Catholic world, uh, like someone who has, let's say, the, the, she was like a hero, a hero for Catholicism, an unexpected hero. And mm -hmm. she realized at, at that moment that when she settled in Rome, she was, let's say, surrounded by uh, a fame, uh, which was not only the fame of the Minerva of the North, but also uh, the lady who was courageous enough to prefer God to her own kingdom. Could you imagine some, let's say, some decision with such an uh, unselfish motive, I would say? Because what would you prefer, the power or the cross? She made up her mind and she chose the cross. But uh, she, uh, all over her life, uh, she seems to look again for the power. Because well. <laughs> in Rome, once in Rome she tried to become the, the queen of uh, uh, Polonia or uh, Naples, or, uh, yeah. Naples. Yeah. and uh, so the eagerness to be uh, queen but is it still alive in her life, all over her life. But it also means that she was not cut in one go and uh, <laughs> that she had, let's say, a lot of facets. Uh, we have to, to accept it and to, to cope with it. And among the different facets, she looked also at her own interest, because that's one thing to be, let's say, the, the ex-queen of Sweden. That's another thing to be in Rome, to have her own court. And if suddenly someone proposed to you, well, by the way, would, we, would you like to take the, the kingdom of Naples? That's a big temptation. <laughs> Even if, if you are considered almost as a saint, at least at the very beginning of your staying in Rome. Because after, let's say, the Monaldeschi affair, things have changed quite a lot, and she was looked at in a different way. So maybe the opportunity to, to take over the kingdom of Naples was something totally unexpected. 
and uh, she, she looked at this as not only as an opportunity, but also a way of, let's say, coming back as a queen. Stefano. Well, um, I guess that the, uh, the best um, description of uh, her abdication and uh, conversion uh, has, in my mind, uh, uh, been given by Swedish historian Kurt Weibull, that in uh, the 1930s wrote uh, uh, an important book on Christina. And he connected the two uh, reasons. Uh, on one hand, as uh, we've been talking about, uh, the impossibility she felt of uh, marrying and giving an heir to the throne. We should keep in mind that Sweden had uh, suffered for, from a civil war uh, not so many decades before Christina's um, coming to the throne. Uh, so it was very important to settle the dynasty of uh, the Vasa, and Christina was uh, uh, compelled, I would say almost obliged, to give a heir to the throne. And then uh, uh, I guess that the religious uh, aspect uh, is, of course, also important. Um, in my mind, you don't put up this whole scene uh, across Europe that we still talk so much about today if you don't believe in some of these values. Uh, saying that, I won't say that Christina was an orthodox Catholic or that she always um, felt this way, but uh, certainly, she was interested in Catholicism, and uh, uh, she was ready to give up uh, much uh, for for her faith. Uh, so I guess that uh, I always try to think about this this way: that uh, in every big decision you make in everybody's life, there are always more than one reason for uh, big steps. So probably uh, this happened to Christine as well. And uh, this helps also to, um, uh, to safeguard uh, the cultural aspect, uh, because of course uh, Christina was uh, uh, very much attracted by uh, the Roman context and milieu. And uh, of course, uh, uh, religious problems, Galileo's uh, um, uh, sentence uh, must have scared her. I think she was aware of uh, some of these uh, aspects, of course. Uh, but the uh, Italian culture had, at that time, which uh, for Italians today, it's uh, beautiful to think, at least, that it had such an appeal uh, coming not only directly from Italy, uh, you mentioned the Jesuits in Stockholm, but even from France. Prime Minister in France at that time was you was uh, Mazarin, or Mazzarino, as uh, we sometimes say in Italy. And uh, the Roman um, uh, values uh, um, of the uh, Urban the uh, the Pope, Barberini's Pope, a great learned and poet, uh, must for sure have appealed to Christina. Uh, so she wouldn't see, I think, Rome uh, as a, uh, uh, a city that constrained uh, culture, but she was very much appealed by the arts, the music, uh, and the literature. So all of these three reasons, I think, in some way must have played some role in our, in our de decision. Well, there is a very famous uh, biography of uh, Cristina, written in the 60s by Stolpe. And uh, in this biography, uh, the life of Christina is presented like a series of defeats, in a way. Uh, what do you think of this vision? Do you think that the life of Christina has been a series of success? Or do you agree with this uh, quite critical vision that was perhaps inspired by the Catholic vision of Stolpe? Um, well, uh, I would say that it was neither a life of uh, um, unsuccess or a life of uh, success all the way. Uh, it was a life of struggle. She had every time to uh, settle on new bases and uh, uh, try to um, settle her own position in different contexts. 
but definitely I would say I agree, I disagree most with the Stolp uh, in this vision he has of uh, Christine as uh, uh, at the end of her life as uh, uh, well uh, uh, this feeling of unsuccess because uh, I don't think that really applies to the case. He is a bit too hard on her. Uh, that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. Even if the books are good and uh, uh, well, really I don't know if you, uh, Jan or Gloria, had the possibility to read this book of uh, Stolpe, or uh, what do you think of this vision, this critical and pessimistic vision of uh, Christina's life as a series of uh, unsuccess? I think she herself would not say uh, my life is or was a success or not. Um, her life, like she lived, is, was her own free will. And she was, during her whole life, alone. alone. She, this was very hard for her. Outside, not outside. She was always busy and... and uh, but inside, for sure, she was always very... Uh, she suffered from um, saudade, uh, this loneliness. But I think she had the intention as a young woman to live as a scientist and at the same time as a true believer. And this is what she thought to find in Rome or in the south of Europe. Uh, there is this wonderful, for me, this wonderful sentence by Christina uh, I am sure or I believe that the, the, the religion never is against a science, or, uh, but I accept religion is over science. So I think she worked very hard inside to come to a balance with her decision to leave Sweden, to leave the throne, and then always was uh, this where this acquaintance Perhaps I could be the queen of Naples or the queen of, of Poland or whatever. But her life was her free will, and this she knew it, it was for sure not an easy life. Mm. Yeah. Well, what makes the life interesting is not only, let's say, success and uh, what you can obtain, but also uh, what you lose, uh, what. Uh, the area in which you, you don't success and well that's a subtle mixture uh, between let's say success and the uh, moment of uh, desperation sometime uh, and uh, that's that gives uh, let's say its uh, specificity and its interest to everyone's life not only queen christina but all of us uh, you know, it's, an, it's not a, a one way and a path and a road uh, with only lights uh, uh, on the road. That's, that's, it's, made of, uh, it's made up of many different things and uh, it gives, uh, it gives to, to each of us uh, a way of uh, uh, being, let's say, either satisfied with ourselves or unsatisfied. Um. Christina has been uh, uh, many times uh, defined as a rebel, as a model of a woman that uh, chooses her way uh, with a very strong will of independence. Uh, but according to you, according to your research, uh, to your vision, which was her attitude towards women? Uh, has never she expressed uh, some ideas about uh, um, the role of women in society, for instance, uh, considering that in that times we, we know very well which was the, 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 the role and the idea of, of uh, women. I think uh, for me, Christina uh, is a clear or was a clear European. Um, during her time, she didn't recognize this, it's clear, but she lived all the whole Europe in case of her languages, eight, seven, eight languages, seven, eight cultures, the north and the south. And um, the Protestantism and Catholicism. So in, in this way, for sure, she's a role model or whatever with 
we could call her uh, a symbol, an emblem, a European. Mm. Yes, but this is what perhaps we perceive now, but I wonder if she herself yeah, expressed uh, uh, some ideas about women in society at uh, her time. Uh, I think her decision that she will not get married was also very clear. So mm. She had uh, experiences and, and then, thank you very much. And so I, I, I could not find in my research uh, clear messages for mm. women. I think for her this was not so important to think as a woman or to think as a man. Mm. So this is for me the reason why I always say she was a female human being. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, like to yeah. I totally agree with, uh, with Gloria, what Gloria has just said, because I, I don't think that she looked at herself as, let's say, being a woman and, let's say, having the same rights as a man. She was first the Queen of Sweden. Yes. Uh, that was one thing, and she, she never... Uh, she never conceived her life as big, being, let's say, the ex-queen of Sweden. That was one thing. And she behaved uh, in a way which for her was totally natural. Uh, she had, let's say, her own way of speaking, her own way of thinking. And uh, she, she was very strong in her beliefs, uh, even though she decided sometimes to uh, worship uh, one thing and, and then to reject it, and she, she did it sometimes with people also. But that was, uh, let's say, a way of feeling free. And in that respect, she, we can look at her from a very, uh, a very close way because it, it gives her a modernity for us because uh, that's, it would be exaggerated to make her, let's say, uh, the first woman uh, who has ever expressed her her wishes and her will so, so clearly. Uh, it would be f to look at her from a modern prospect, but uh, she, she looked at herself as someone who could do whatever she wanted and who could act like a man. Do you agree on that? Well, uh, <clears throat> um, um, of course, I agree on the vision of Christina as a well, a rebel, maybe it's a strong word, but uh, surely I think that some of the popes, uh, we should bear in mind that there were four popes Christina met during a uh, time in Rome, would certainly have uh, called her a rebel. I, I think so, because uh, uh, she was, uh, for them, uh, difficult to cope with sometimes. Uh, but, uh, of course, rebel is uh, maybe too uh, strong a word and uh, doesn't apply maybe for the period, but uh, talking about women and her uh, relationship uh, or her vision of women in society, uh, that I would say is very twofold because on one side she's very critical um, in her biography and in some of her maxims she's clearly um, I would say um, not at all uh, uh, the idea of Christina we have today uh, because uh, she uh, tends to, she, uh, she really seeks to avoid company of women and uh, she is clearly interested in uh, uh, the company of men. She finds them more learned, uh, the conversation with them more interesting. So I would say that uh, uh, maybe she is in some way settling her own unique position as a woman, in a, um, as a reigning woman. Uh, she doesn't want, for instance, to uh, mention Elizabeth I at all, uh, which could have been an example for her, but she avoids on purpose to uh, compare herself with, with her. But uh, on the other hand, uh, and that probably is the most important part of Christina's uh, achievement and heritage. She had a very strong and important, uh, uh, how you say, image, um, a very strong model for women uh, entering culture, uh, and especially in what is my speciality in the academic domain. Uh, because Christina, even if no women were allowed in her own academy, 
was only for male members, but the academy that gave birth, so that Cristina's academy gave birth to this Academia dell'Arcadia, was among the was the first one in Italy to accept women. And the women uh, had a very important role uh, as poets in uh, the life of the academy, uh, looking up to Cristina. Uh, so Cristina uh, became, I would say, a model for uh, women participation to culture in Italy at the end of the 16th century and in Rome, which is a, a very important achievement on our side. So, uh, well, in order to approach the, the general theme of today for a Europe of culture, uh, my question is, so which is uh, her importance for the contemporary European culture today? It's really possible to make Cristina a, a model of a symbol of uh, the cultural heritage, because uh, I would like to be a little critic and provocative. I mean, uh, she became a Catholic. Uh, she chose uh, uh, to be uh, faithful to his idea of an absolutist monarchy. She seems to belong to the past, in a way, in her choices. And uh, I wonder, how can we choose Christina as a model for today and uh, as a symbol of European culture? I think on Christina we see um, the possibility, the capacity uh, to renew always uh, the own strengths because more or less each decade she was, she was rejuvenated and for me like her uh, favorite in the miserable animals, uh, like a phoenix, she always come again and again of the ashes. And so I think like the phoenix could be a symbol or emblem for Europe. Uh, Christina should be our symbol or emblem because uh, this capacity to renew the, the strengths and begin anew. This is typically also for the culture of Europe. We, we, have, we have and we had in Europe a lot of wars. The first attempt to unite Europe with the Roman Imperium collapsed, we know. And then 2,000 years, always we tried again and again to unite and to unite. So our capacity hope, to yes, change. Yes. Is, uh, <laughs> and now we hope, now we hope with such an emblem or such a symbol like Christina, uh, this uh, we will we will come to a good end with the and, United uh, Her States. symbol was the phoenix, no? Yeah, the, the phoenix to, to, to come to always as a new birth. Uh, yes, from yes. So for, for me, she is a symbol and an emblem, like the like the phoenix. Yeah. Um, symbol for Europe, but what is sure is that uh, the way she was, is, uh, her thirst for knowledge uh, has something and some values that can be uh, quite close to European values. And when I think of, when I speak of uh, thirst for knowledge, I also have in mind, let's say, the way she uh, placed art on top of every single value, because for her, art was a link between uh, nations and minds, between people uh, and kingdoms at that time. And she, she didn't consider art in itself as, let's say, the simple fact of amassing paintings, let's say Flemish painters, uh, uh, great uh, British artists. She was not, if, if I can make a comparison between uh, Louis XIV at that time and Christina. Louis XIV uh, was building uh, his own image as a symbol of glory and magnificence for himself. And Versailles uh, was a stage on which uh, every day uh, Louis XIV was the main actor of the stage. And Christina, Christina's purpose was totally different. She liked to have, let's say, the best masterpieces of art, whatever be the nation. 
She liked, let's say, English painting, uh, French cabinet makers, uh, she liked Italian musicians, and that was a way, let's say, of gathering every single culture. In that respect, uh, that one then can be, let's say, the first approach to one uh, common uh, European value. And the second one is, for me, a tolerance for uh, different opinions uh, and different religions. So, uh, in her time, it was unusual, let's say, to care for minorities, and she cared for minorities. She sighed, she sighed close to, minor, to minorities, and uh, if, we, if we take an example, for instance, she was, let's say, not only advised by a Jewish, but also she, she owned them a lot of money. Uh, and so she stood up for Jewish. She stood up for Protestant when uh, Louis XIV was uh, uh, making war against, uh, against Protestant in France at, at that time. And she was a Catholic and she was sustaining the Protestant in France. So it's, it's a way of, let's say, being uh, not only the ex-queen of Sweden or the queen of Rome, but a way of looking at her own position uh, from a very high point. You know, she was, let's say, on top of Europe in a way, because she didn't belong to any party. Mm. So that's also interesting for me. Stefano? I agree on uh, tolerance, and I agree on uh, um, Christina uniting Europe, because uh, I think what we see today and what we are in desperately in need of is uh, some kind of agreement between the North and the South uh, of Europe. Okay. And uh, that is something that she achieved as a Swede with a German mother. She came to Italy, uh, made a substantial, important, um, um, important things for Italian culture, but not only uh, a connection with Spain, uh, France, not least, uh, so, Cristina is a personality that unites uh, different, uh, different aspects of Europe. So, um, I would say that even if it's true, she belongs to the past. Uh, the 17th century was very much different from today, and she is a representative of uh, absolutism. Uh, but uh, this aspect of tolerance is a way in which she opened up her academy to different um, uh, viewpoints and the fact that she stands, she tries to uh, settle a treaty between uh, Spain and France. She had uh, still, as you mentioned, in Rome, uh, a political uh, activity and effort. So uh, the way in which she unites Europe, I think, so maybe she could be a good symbol, I would say. So, I would like perhaps to give uh, the audience uh, the possibility to express their questions to our guests. So, I wonder if there is any question. This literary biography is not only about the friendship between uh, Christina and Anton Rivera, but it is uh, the novel or the biography about the whole life. And it's clear also about uh, other uh, situations in Rome and, and uh, about the Monaldesco affair. And it is uh, the whole life. You, you could find the whole life uh, about Christina in this novel. Of 
course, I didn't find a, a life interesting enough. But you know, I think as a writer, you have a, a freedom, a total freedom to uh, deal with your characters. You can kill them at the first page. That would be a very bad <laughs> idea because there would be no novel at all. Uh, you can, uh, let's say, invent meetings which uh, never took place. Uh, and you can add whatever you want. That's a terrible liberty which can, of course, uh, lead you nowhere at all. Uh, but, you know, I don't... I would like to ask you a question. What is important, to tell the truth or to make you dream or to make you, let's say, escape from your own life? Uh, you know, that's the purpose of every single writer. We want people to, uh, let's say, dream and have, uh, uh, what do you expect? All, all of you, what do you expect? You, you expect a page turner or a book you cannot, let's say, read uh, up to maybe 10 pages and then you are fed up with it. I don't think that's the purpose of lecture because first of all, there are very, very few people really read, at least in France today. So uh, my idea was, let's say, to take uh, Christina's life and uh, to, to be as close as possible to history as needed. And then let's say to uh, invent some other let's say, figures uh, who will meet her during her lifetime and who will, let's say, sustain the plot. Did I, did I answer well to your question? Of course. Uh, <laughs> you think that we are all liars? I mean, in real life, <laughs> we all lie. You know, no, not, not, not every day, maybe 10 times a day. Uh, but, but, you know, I think that writers uh, have to be forgiven, let's say, for the lies, just for the sake of, let's say, for the sake of writing. That's, that's our freedom. And so that's why I, I don't think that there is a, a real sin to invent new uh, new characters in uh, in a novel. That's uh, that's the purpose of the novel itself. Yes, madam. Matt. Uh, I have a question to Stefano and maybe also to Jan because as a symbol we need Christina maybe as a European symbol. I I fully advocate this. And then the border between her historical life and the potential of her influence is of course not so important for us contemporary. For us, contemporary is the, the potential of her symbol, tolerance, living together in Europe. That is much more important than actually tying this to days and fiction and, and, and places. But my question is rather, in, this, uh, in her lifetime as a queen, she was, of course, mostly dealing with crown heads that were all men around by, by nature of, of, of the, the conditions of that time, but the, where she could influence the rules, like in Academia Academia, was that open to everyone? But what is the status of this Academia? Was it open to everyone? Um, well, <coughs> no, it wasn't. Her Academy uh, uh, was open to men. Uh, the Academy that was inspired by Christina's own Academy, the one she wrote uh, statues for, Academia uh, Academia de l'Arcade that came the year after her death. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, on uh, the idea, I think, of uh, the first uh, custode generale, the first uh, 
um, how do you say, secretary, it's not a very good <laughs> translation, but uh, Giovanni Maria Crescimbeni, uh, the academy was opened to women as well. And there I think that uh, Cristina, uh, that was uh, chosen, that is important to bear in mind, she was chosen as uh, the posthumous uh, patron of the academy. Uh, so when Academia dell'Arcadia started meeting, it was really in uh, Queen Cristina's anda, as you would say in Swedish, Swedish. Uh, in her spirit, in her, um, for her heritage. So uh, I guess that if Cristina uh, has the possibility, the potentiality to become some kind of symbol because of these uh, good qualities, I would say, tolerance, culture, um, the fact that she unites different parts of Europe, uh, that should be, of course, a, a symbol that is the possibility to be criticized and uh, all uh, continually uh, being discussed. Because, of course, um, there is something maybe that we will talk about during the afternoon, but uh, if we have to be totally anachronistic, I'm very much sure that Christina wouldn't have liked the Turkish uh, participation in the European Union, because uh, she was trying to build. Uh, so she has to be discussed all the time and on all levels. Uh, but uh, maybe uh, with uh, uh, the richness of Europe, is the different voices, the different languages, uh, the different backgrounds. So uh, we have all the time to discuss between each other and um, discussing the critical points, Catholicism, the uh, fact that she belongs to the past also, but even discussing these positive values that she inspired then, uh, giving access to women with her image, to women, to culture but even, uh, as I said, some uh, more critical and negative parts. I don't know if it's a good answer. Yeah. I, I would like to add something to, 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 to Matt's uh, question. Uh, first of all, we have to keep in mind, especially for French citizens that I am, that the French Academy only opened its doors a few years ago to women. That was Marguerite Yourcenar, who was the first academician uh, to be admitted uh, in France. And even though the academy dated back to the 17th century, we have had to, to wait for the, the second part of the 20th century to admit women. So just to keep it in mind. Madame? Coming from the US Doctor of Literature from the University, I would like to put a few very basic questions. To all of you, I'm very honored to be here. I admire you very much. It's very enjoyable. Very basic questions. Until the last century, women couldn't have any property at all. And uh, most people couldn't read and write. At the time of Christina, how many women at all could read and write? Because that is putting her, that's make her a bit outstanding. So could you please uh, enlighten me? To read? <coughs> Uh, this we always have to recognize that uh, 1650 and, and in these decades uh, uh, the, the majority of, of people were not able to read, and especially the women, and so uh, she was privileged in case of her education, in case of, of all. Uh, but this was the reason that she lived at that time as with her free will, with her own uh, decision, all the, she went her own path and, and she lived all these attitudes, what we now heard, uh, this tolerance and, and she was not uh, a thinker in, in small things. Uh, for her, Europe was not, this is uh, Vienna and this is the other city, Europe was uh, Europe and, and she went, it, she walked from one culture to the other with her knowledge about all these languages. Uh, it's clear she was, uh, she was an example and she was far, uh, far ahead of her time. Awesome. Um, can I ask the uh, panelists, in, in the end, uh, after studying that um, very special figure, how would you characterize the relationship of 
Latina River country. Uh, I would say at least complex. Uh, <laughs> uh, she was still in economic, uh, well, sustaining, even if the payments of the rent uh, she had kept in the Abdication Act, um, uh, the taxes from the city of Norrköping, for example, Gotland, and uh, well, uh, there are some persons in the audience that know this better than me. But uh, uh, so she had. Uh, this uh, uh, still uh, important relationship with Sweden, always on an economic side. Of course, uh, uh, she left the country and she left the uh, religion of the state. And at that time, this was a big uh, movement. Uh, but still, uh, I would like to say that uh, uh, some travelers, some Swedes, coming to Rome were, uh, to say welcome in a palace, maybe it's a, a big word, but uh, I would uh, still say, that's my feeling more than something I know for certain, that she still kept feelings for the country and uh, she had also an idea of the country uh, having been a, a part of that Europe she had moved to uh, not so uh, long before her time. So uh, I don't say she had the, uh, the idea of Sweden becoming Catholic again. <laughs> that, that would have been impossible, but she still had many ties with Sweden. That I think you could say. Yes. Yes, I'd like to come back to the main thing, which is uh, Christine as a symbol of the European culture identity. And I was... Uh, uh, thinking about another queen, which has a lot of uh, uh, points in common uh, with uh, uh, Christine, but that nobody would dream of being a symbol of the European identity, that's Catherine the Great. Catherine the Great changed religion, she changed country, she wrote music, she appointed scientists to Petersburg, she was one of the greatest collector of art since the heritage today is still filled up with the paintings that people bought for her in, in France and another country. So what, but yet we will not see her as a symbol of European identity Christ and uh, uh, culture. What is then the difference? Could it be that uh, what you describe Christie, but you not put her into a context? The great difference that in 1660, Europe is in crisis. Uh, Germany is in ruin, the uh, revolution in England, Spain is on decline, uh, uh, actually it's only the Polish and Lithuanian the Union, which uh, stands as a, a, an obstacle between the Ottoman uh, power, which is uh, trying to, to uh, make more and more into Europe. Could it be that uh, uh, the greatest thing is that she uh, succeeded in doing what she did in a situation which socially, economically, and politically was quite difficult? Europe was not really. Uh, country, uh, a part of the world mm -hmm. group, which in 1760, 100 years later, is still totally different. Uh, this uh, love of uh, uh, richness and, and wealth in Europe, which uh, in, uh, in 1660 was a country. How much is the context I mean, uh, uh, a validation of the idea of making a, a symbol for European culture and identity? Perhaps I try it only with one sentence. Perhaps the symbol could be not only Christina, but the symbol could be the phoenix, her favorite mythical animal. Because I think this uh, forces to renew always, these are forces of, of our continent, of, of Europe. And this she lived. She sometimes began anew in her life. And this is typically for Europe. Because uh, the strengths to unite Europe are 2,000 years old, and it, uh, now we have, I think, one of the last chances to, to begin anew, like the phoenix. And this, the phoenix, is one part of Christina, perhaps in this sense. Yes? That's exactly what I was thinking about, because uh, 
we are in crisis today. And all the uh, proposal for European Union, from the PRB board uh, in 11 all the way to Lenin yes, yes. in the 1940s, have occurred in a situation where Europe is in crisis. Mm -hmm. There was a crisis in Europe in 1650, and that would give the legitimacy to her as a symbol, as an emblem of the European Union, the rebirth. But we have to, yes, we have to begin a new, like the phoenix of the ashes. Yes. I have a question to Stefano. My name is Parokos, and I'm very interested in Maxims of Apollos. And then, like Christina, I like La Rochefoucauld very much. Uh, some questions about this. Uh, if Christina had lived today, would she have been on Twitter then? Or would she have Twitter? That's it, one question. Another question is, what's the difference between poetry and maxims and aphorisms? Oof, uh, that uh, second one is, uh, I thought the first one was more difficult, but uh, <laughs> b b both of them are really difficult. Yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, saying that I'm not at all an expert in the maxims, and uh, what, what I've been writing mostly about is sonnets. And uh, uh, actually, Susanna Okeman, <coughs> that just, she, uh, when uh, discussing my thesis, uh, we talked about the fact that I didn't uh, maybe take into consideration too much the maxims, and uh, I should have, really, because they are interesting. The only problem with them is that uh, the maxim, uh, as far as I know, uh, is such a short sentence and uh, uh, um, contains so much in it that uh, sometimes uh, uh, her maxims tend to uh, say against each other because they are, of course, written during a long period of time. And uh, this particularity of the maxim uh, concentrating so much significance in a very short sentence does that uh, sometimes they are a bit bewildering uh, uh, to use, uh, to give a, a broader context, a broader uh, significance. Uh, th that, I hope, will do somehow for the second question. For the first one, uh, it's difficult to say, but she, uh, well, I mean, Barack Obama, I think, is, uses Twitter a lot. <laughs> uh, she liked to be in the center, so uh, why not? And she liked, uh, she was up to date, so yes, I think she would be Twittering today. <laughs> yes? discussions between his, uh, Christina and the cat. And uh, how do you value uh, the perjury and influence he had on her as <coughs> the decision she took? I would like to say that she was really interested in uh, Descartes coming to, to Stockholm because in a way it gave her an opportunity to be looked at uh, in a different way uh, from France because she was known as the daughter of uh, Gustave Adolphe and that was one thing, but she was not yet known as the Minerva of the North. And in a way uh, she used uh, Descartes' fame for herself and she also learned a lot uh, from him uh, in a lot of areas, uh, mathematics, physics, science, uh, religion also certainly, because they discussed that point. Uh, but these being said, uh, you know, we, we, we used to think that uh, after a while, 
Descartes was left uh, in some part of this castle and uh, totally forgotten. Uh, I don't know whether it's true or not because I wasn't there at that time, even if I look old. Uh, but uh, what I would like to say is that she has had a lot of interest in Descartes and then afterwards she was infatuated with Leibniz and Spinoza. Uh, so she was, uh, that was part of her, her thirst for knowledge. Uh, but he has had undoubtedly uh, quite, uh, quite a big influence uh, when she met him because she was still quite young. And uh, even though she had been brought up to, to, to become a queen, uh, her interests were so wide that he was, let's say, part of her interest at that time. I don't know whether I answer properly your question. The final question, because then we have to... <laughs> Please. Uh, my French uh, literature history said le climat le tua. The climate kills him. That's the sum up of Descartes in Stockholm. But this is, of course, not true. It's a great shame that Sweden hasn't yet taken up the biggest contribution to European civilization that Descartes and, and that period brought, namely the Ballet de Cour that Christina tried to bring back to Sweden, and that Descartes, well, an American has criticized the idea, but we, we believe that Descartes wrote the libretto for the famous ballet Freds are the conception of peace after the Great War, and that we had brought uh, French musicians to Sweden as Gustav Adolf had brought German musicians to Sweden in order to get music up to the European level, which we did already in those days. And we have never taken back that wonderful ballet onto the stage. And this is the great shame for us. And this confidence might we, we tried in uh, the wonderful symposium in Park on Chalier to bring them. They brought some music to that. And we, we, I can give you a libretto and a score with the parts for the musicians for this family. And if this is one result of this conference, I can die in peace. <laughs> But, uh, you know, we have here in front of us a specialist of ballet that is working now in Paris. Well, a specialist to be. I hope I'm uh, <laughs> working on uh, Christina's ballet uh, during a rain. Uh, of course, uh, uh, one of the most important is uh, La Naissance de la Paix, Fritz Ovel. And uh, uh, the discussion about uh, Descartes having written uh, the whole of the libretto or some verses of it is difficult to solve. I don't think it is possible, but what is sure, and uh, there we can uh, settle uh, an important thing he did. He sent the libretto to France. I will tell you more of this. <laughs> yes, yes, and, uh, but th th that was not uh, a minor uh, thing to do because this shows the way these ballads were circling, circulating around the courts, and uh, uh, how this libretto had, uh, uh, as one of its main aims, to show what was happening at the Swedish court and communicating uh, important major uh, political decisions. So if the music is there, I think it was, would be a wonderful idea to put, put it on scene and uh, necessary. The problem is uh, with the dance, but s some uh, French uh, dance companies are doing uh, this wonderful spectacle, uh, Christine Bell, I think, which is a spectacle in Paris at uh, uh, um, uh, the Center for Dance. Uh, so the possibilities are there. I'm uh, working only on the poetry uh, with the poor knowledge about the music and the dance. I couldn't help too much on that, but uh, it would be wonderful if this could happen. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I just wanted to ask that we are, the Royal Palace, 
music festival of this building open to the concept that was proposed to the French Institute this year. We will do it next year, I hope. You know about the music that was performed to Queen Christina, performed by specialists from France and Brussels and Austria. We are welcoming this project. And when I hear about this, I didn't know that the libretto and music together existed of this piece. Uh, but now that I know it, I can just say if I can influence the continuation of the Royal Festival, you are welcome. Thank you to our guest. Well, I can't draw any conclusion because, I mean, it could be too difficult, but the image that I will keep uh, after this debate of Christina is uh, a Christina that perhaps will twitter in today, who knows, that uh, has left a very important heritage uh, in many different fields, a woman that had a very strong thirst of knowledge, that care for uh, minority, and uh, that had a very strong engagement for arts, all these elements makes her a symbol of Europe. Thank you very much.